find your way to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to go ahead and read our passage for today. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and beginning in verse 1. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, and I would like you to note that gifts is in italics, and we'll explain that in a bit. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge, through the same Spirit. To another, faith, by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings, by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Paul begins this new section, and it's clearly that it's a response to a question or a problem that the church has asked Paul for some advice on. They had a concern in the Corinthian church about spiritual gifts. It is possible that in a service, there was maybe somebody who was blaspheming the Lord, or they were saying he was blaspheming the Lord while speaking in tongues. And so it had caused some sort of disruption. That's one possibility. But whatever it is, they had questions about the spiritual gifts. He begins by telling them that he did not want them to be carried away in ignorance. especially in the matter of spiritual gifts. Now, now he was not calling them stupid, because sometimes we use the word, hey, that boy is ignorant. But in Greek, the word knowledge is gnosis. So it's speaking of knowledge. And when we're ignorant, we are a gnosis. We are away from knowledge. That means you simply lack knowledge. But a lack of knowledge in this area was threatening to destroy this body of believers. And I find that there are two extreme reactions to this, this issue of spiritual gifts. The first reaction is to deny that the gifts exist, that they are not valid for today. The other extreme reaction is the abuse of the spiritual gifts, the making up, in a sense, of spiritual gifts that are not of God. Either way, we know that these spiritual gifts, that if we're ignorant in these areas, it is extremely dangerous. And how do we know this? Well, one way we know this is that Paul devotes three chapters to this topic. Meat, sacrifice to idols, one chapter, right? Other issues in the church got one chapter, but this particular issue of spiritual gifts is so important, he devotes 
three full chapters. The spiritual gifts was an issue of great importance to the church at Corinth. And brothers and sisters, it is just as vital to us today. And so today I want to share with you four essential things we must know about the Holy Spirit. Things that will remove our ignorance and prevent us from getting carried away. As the title says, let's not get carried away. The first is that the greatest gift that you're ever going to receive from the Holy Spirit is himself. Second, he gives gifts to you to bless the body. The third point we're going to come across is he has many gifts to give. And last, he is in charge of the distribution of those gifts. So let's look again at verse 1. And one through three. He says there now concerning spiritual gifts. But remember the gifts is in italics. The word spiritual there is the Greek pneumatikos, which is really referring to a spiritual person. Gifts is added, and the context I think allows for that, because if you look in verse four, we see that he goes on to gifts. The spiritual man is going to have spiritual gifts. So we are all pneumaticos if we have the Spirit of God in us. But Paul says, when you were pagans, you were carried away or carried astray to mute idols. I think it's important that we just stop for a second and consider why did he say mute idols? A mute is someone that can't speak. There's no mistake that Paul uses this word, and, and it's very important that he uses it. See, the idol cannot speak. Our God can and does speak. No idol ever in all of history has ever spoken. Idols cannot offer words of comfort. Idols cannot give commands, and an idol cannot warn you of danger. It cannot exhort you. It cannot guide you. They have no words. But God said, let there be light. And there was light. The universe was created by our God with words. Jesus, the word become flesh. Words are important, aren't they? And idols, whatever idol you, des you want to serve, any other God other than the one and true God is an idol and they are mute and they cannot speak and they have nothing to say. Verse 3, we see that he says, I would have you know. Remember he told us, I don't want you to be ignorant. Do you hear Paul's heart? He's like, Listen, this is, this is very bad. If you remain in your ignorance in this particular area of spiritual gifts, it could destroy you. And they've raised an issue. They've said, listen, we got this problem. Can you help us square this? And now he begins by saying, I would have you know. How do we get rid of ignorance? By studying the Bible. <laughs> it's simple, right? It seems too simple, but... We can be carried away so easily if we have no understanding of the scriptures. That's why here at Calvary Chapel, we will always be verse by verse, always be chapter by chapter, and we will always be book by book because we need to have an understanding of the word of God or else we will be led astray. We will be carried away by winds of doctrine. And God does not want this for us. He wants us to be informed, not ignorant. I would have you know. This is the first thing that he thinks that we need to know about the gifts of the Spirit or how to be pneumaticos, a spiritual man. And it's simple. The greatest gift that you'll ever receive from the Holy Spirit. See, we want to go to the gifts. You want me to get to that bottom part and, well, what's my gift? And my gift is, and I've been walking in this gift for, you know, there's all these things. Hey, you need to stop. I mean, it's just like at Christmas, right? Your, your parents who love you so much get you this, 
you know, matchbox track. And, you're, and the first thing you do is you take off and go into a little corner, set it up, and you're not talking to your parents anymore. The ones that gave it to you are sitting over here completely isolated from you because you've got your gift. And I want to say that that is extremely dangerous, isn't it? That we neglect the giver of the gifts and, and highlight the gifts. No, we need to, from the get-go, understand that the greatest gift that you'll ever receive from the Holy Spirit is himself. The presence of the Holy Spirit, it tells us here, actually changes our confession, doesn't it? What you say about Jesus reveals whether you have the Spirit of God or not. If you disparage or if you deny Jesus, the word used there is anathema, which means doomed to destruction. If you say Jesus is useless and he is doomed to destruction, if he is anathema, listen, the Holy Spirit didn't say that. The Holy Spirit would never say that. The Holy Spirit is absent if you are one saying that Jesus is is anything less than God, anything less than who he said he was, anything less than the Holy Spirit reveals. If you disparage or deny Jesus, it's not Jesus that's anathema. <laughs> You've lined yourself up with anathema. The Holy Spirit is absent. But if we praise Jesus, it is equally important. If we pray, praise Jesus, don't think that you did it. Right? I'm praising Jesus. The reason you're praising Jesus is the Holy Spirit came into your life, revealed that Jesus was the truth, you received it, and now you're walking with Jesus. It was all a work of the Lord. It's interesting to note that calling Jesus anathema is probably the phrase that Paul, or Saul at the time, that he would force the Christians to say, or at least he would try to force them to say, Jesus is anathema to prove that, you know, that they didn't believe anymore. And of course, any true believer would never deny the Lord like that. So it's pretty interesting. This is what Saul said. But the presence of the Holy Spirit had so changed Saul on the road to Damascus, now this new man cries out, Jesus is Lord. Do you see the difference that the Holy Spirit makes? Only the Holy Spirit could do that. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. And we need to know that the Holy Spirit is the greatest gift that we have. And we need to know, right? That if we're saying any good things, if we are saying true things, if we're saying correct things about Jesus, this too is by the Spirit of God not by your smarts, not by your ingenuity. This is the first and most important gift of the Spirit. Before we get to any of those others, we need to have the gift of the Holy Spirit and understand how incredible it is that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Jesus is Lord. You remember that one time when Peter got it right? If you have your Bible... Uh, you remember that one time when Lee got it right? Um, turn in your Bibles to Matthew 13 with me. Matthew 13, verse 13 through 17. Matthew 13, verses 13 through 17. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, well, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or, or one of the prophets. Obviously, there's confusion about who Jesus truly is. And that confusion exists today, doesn't it? You know, there's many cults out there that diminish Jesus and say he's, he's just a teacher. He was just maybe a prophet. Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Right? He declared himself to be God, and he either is or he is not. He's either a liar, a, a lunatic, or he's the Lord. But look what Simon Peter said. Amazing. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
And he's probably like looking around, right? Like, who just said that? Because he's used to speaking because he's got his foot in his mouth, right? <laughs> Blessed, Jesus answers him and he said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Flesh and blood did not reveal, you didn't go to school for this. Well, where'd you get it? Hey, by the way, I have no formal degree in theology. Oh, everyone's clicking off, right? Like, oh, he doesn't have a master's degree of divinity from such and such place. Uh, no, I don't. But I have the spirit of God in me. And any good and right teacher of the gospel, that's their qualification. Training is great. Don't hear me wrong. If it's at a uh, gospel proclaiming university, because many are falling away. But Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. See, the greatest spiritual gift is the Holy Spirit. You remember that Jesus said, it will be better. He's talking to his disciples before he is going to go to the cross. And he says to his disciples, it would be better if I go away. And they're like, what are you talking about? They still hadn't even wrapped their heads around the fact that he was leaving. It would be better if I go away. Why? Because then the comforter will come. You see, the Holy Spirit is essential in salvation. No one gets saved without the Holy Spirit. There are three experiences with the Holy Spirit. Some of you guys probably already know this, but there are three experiences with the Holy Spirit based on three different uh, Greek words, para, en, and epi. Para means alongside. That's the convicting force of the Holy Spirit. We don't know Jesus as Savior yet, but all of a sudden we're starting to go, maybe, maybe I need help. I got all this sin. I, I can't go to the temple and sacrifice. What am I going to do? That's the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what it says in John 16, 8. John 16, 8. And when he has come, Jesus is speaking of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Three things we need to be convicted of. You need to be convicted of sin. You need to be convicted that there is righteousness in one, in only one. Jesus Christ was the only sinless, perfect man, 100%. There has never been an expose uh, book ever written about Jesus. Jackie Collins, there's been books about her, right? The second experience of the Holy Spirit, N, that's when he comes in, E-N, in. He seals us. Ephesians 1.13 says, In him you have trusted after you heard the word of truth. You need to hear the word of truth, and then you need to trust in it. But you have to hear it first. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You got the seal of approval. But the Holy Spirit is not only essential in salvation, it's essential in sanctification. Sanctification, a big fancy Christian word, just means you're becoming more like Jesus. You're acting, you're speaking, conforming, being more like Jesus day by day, that's the appeal. He empowers us. He comes upon us. As, they, as the Holy Spirit came upon the believers in the book of Acts in first 1, 8, but you, Jesus speaking of their need to wait for the Holy Spirit, he said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come, Epi has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Bellevue, in all Judea, 
Marion County, and Samaria, Florida, and the ends of the earth. There's also a truth, though. We can, be carry, we can get in this flow with the Holy Spirit. We're first born again, and then, and then we, get, we grow in Christ-likeness. But many people are being carried away with sin, aren't they? Carried and just, and it's a slow drift often. But see, the Holy Spirit wants to help you out. You need to ask him. And the fourth thing, he not only seals us, he not only convicts us of sin and seals us for the day of redemption and empowers us to live our faith, he also makes Jesus known to us. These are some great reasons why the Holy Spirit should be our focus. We should be, thank you for the Holy Spirit and thank you for the gifts. Thank you for the Holy Spirit and then thank you for the gifts. But he makes Jesus known to us. And we could go on and on, couldn't we? The Holy Spirit guides us. He reminds us of Jesus' words. He comforts us. He is dwelling within us. And we could go on and on, extolling the virtues of the Holy Spirit. And I know, you guys are getting anxious. You're like, let's get into the Holy Spirit. Let's get to the gifts already. I want to get to the gifts. You know, like our, our parents would always like, my mom would make this awesome breakfast. And I mean, you would... You just hoover down that breakfast because you wanted to get to the gifts. But any and every discussion about the gifts of the Holy Spirit ought to begin with this reminder. The giver of those gifts is far better than the gifts themselves. And the greatest spiritual gift is the Holy Spirit. So let's look at verses 4 through 7 where we're going to consider that the Holy Spirit gives gifts to you, not for you, but to bless the body. This is the second thing we need to know. The gifts ain't about you. But too many times we see in churches where it's clearly about that person. It's clearly out of order. It's all about them. And Look at me and look at my gift. Look at me and look at my gift. You see, that's backwards. It's upside down. It's out of order. But Paul says that there are varieties of gifts. The word there is charisma. So to be charismatic is not necessarily bad, although in some circles the charismatic thing has been taken to extremes. And notice that it says, but the same spirit then it moves on, Paul moves on to, there's a variety of ministries. That's diaconus, like deacons. A work, a, a ministry. And it's the same, not pneuma anymore, but the same curios, the same Lord, the Holy Spirit, the Son. And this is how I minister because I, there are a variety of ministries. There's a variety of gifts. And not everybody has the same gifts. And some people have a couple here and a couple there. And, and you have this gift and you have this gift. But I don't have that gift. Some, sometimes we have the same gift. And how I minister may be different. That gift in you, you may use it to minister to a certain group of people where I take that gift and I minister to another group of people in a different way. There's a variety of gifts and there's a variety of ministries. And lastly, there's a variety of operations and their gamma. Variety of options, the way it is exercised. And here, it's not the same pneuma, it's not the same diacon or the same curios, excuse me. It is the same theos. Huh. Those that deny the Trinity. There is another place where we see the Trinity. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Boom. Paul said it. There are diversities of gifts, ministries, and operations. But it has one purpose, doesn't it? And it didn't say so that Lee could be blessed. And everybody could look at Lee because Lee has this gift. 
Hmm. The body is to be blessed. The body is to be protected. The body is to be encouraged. It's to be complete. It's to be full, energized for service. All of these things. And this is an area where we could be carried away in ignorance. If, if we, but we must remember that the gifts serve a common purpose. They are to bless the body. Say that with me. It's to bless the body. It's not to bless you. But listen, am I blessed that I get to teach? Absolutely. The Holy Spirit has given me the gift of teaching. But here's something I also know. He's also given me Maybe, I don't want to call it a thorn in the flesh, but a, a bookmark, because I can go back to my first day of teaching in school and realize what a wreck I was, how nervous I was. I thought I was going to die, literally, getting up in front of teenagers and trying to teach. But the Holy Spirit fans that gift into flame. It's for the profit of all. It's not about you. Let's talk about a man who got it wrong, okay? I'm kind of a person who kind of understands things when you give me a negative example. Who is a guy? Well, let's go turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And we'll begin in verse 9. Acts chapter 8, verse 9. But there was a certain man named were called Simon, who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great. That's how you can tell a false teacher. I'm so great. You should love me. My favorite three people are me, myself, and I. Simon, and he was practicing sorcery, which is an abomination to God. Right? All throughout scripture, sorcery is not something you should be messing with. But Simon was, but he's come to faith, you see. And he was practicing sorcery in the city, and he had that city in his grip. They just loved him. He was fascinating to them. He was doing things before their eyes, and they were like, whoa. Everyone, it says in verse 10, gave heed to him from the least to the greatest saying, this man is a great, is the great power of God. He's a power of something, but it ain't of God. Sorcery is demonic. Sorcery's source is the evil one. Verse 11, and they heeded him because he had astonished them with sorceries for a very long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. Wow. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. That was something that he had fake miracles and fake signs that he was able to do. And so that was something that was like, wow, that's pretty Look at this guy. Those are actually real. And so for a man like Simon, absolutely fascinating. It sucked him right in. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had, not fallen, upon, he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. There is a separate baptism of the Holy Spirit that is available to anyone who would believe. There is a proof text right there. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. I will pay for this ability. I will pay for this gift. And we see the ludicrousness of that right but he's trying to pay peter hey give me that ability also and peter's got some very sharp words for him but peter said to him your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of god could be purchased with money 
The gift is not about you. Let's move, turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we'll pick it up in verse 8. For to one is given the word of wisdom. See, not all of the gifts are the same. It would be a boring church if everyone had the same gift. For, let's just take prophecy. If everyone prophesied, which would be great if some did, we, we encourage that. We, we hope that prophecy is coming through the word itself. But if everybody did that, who would they be pro prophesying to? If everybody had that gift. That's like the body being made up of only eyes, right? Which we'll get to later. But Paul emphasizes each time it is the same Holy Spirit who gives the gifts. He, the Holy Spirit, has many gifts, and he can distribute them as they're needed. I mean, as a pastor, I, I look and I go, you know, I think we need this, or I think we need this. This would be great if we had somebody that had this gift. But it's going to be so incomplete. The Holy Spirit sees everything. And the Holy Spirit is so obedient to Jesus, right? His whole mission is to guide us in truth, to keep us going toward Jesus Christ. You know, the Holy Spirit doesn't have his own agenda, does he? The Holy Spirit is about Jesus' agenda. And what is Jesus' agenda but to build the church? And so the Holy Spirit has been given to us so that we can have gifts that are going to help the body move forward and do the work of God as he's called us to, to build the church. He is able to give them to us today. Now let me ask the person who is of that mindset. I have a couple questions for that person who says that the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are no longer valid. Okay? I, I just want you to consider these questions, if you would. Why did Paul correct the church at Corinth about spiritual gifts? Why bother? And in fact, why did he take three chapters on the topic if it was not something, if the gifts were just going to cease? Why correct something that's going to go away? Okay? Here's my second que question. Person who thinks that the gifts have gone away with the apostles. Do you think the church has no need of these things that are here in verses 8 through 10? Do you think the church has no need of these things? Or, or do you want to take an honest look at the church and say, yes, we actually need more of this so the church is healthy? And then I would ask also the people on the other side of the aisle, those carried away to the extremes with the Holy Spirit. Do you see laughing in the Spirit? Do you see barking like dogs, etc., in, the, in this list or in the list in Romans chapter 12? Do you see that there? Do you see any reason why that would be there? Knowing that the gifts are not for you, they are for the edification of the body. I'm sorry, I'm just not edified by you barking like a dog. I'm not edified when a person, this has literally happened to me in a church. I've been in a church, the pastor is in the pulpit teaching the word of God, and the people behind me are laughing in the spirit. I can't pay attention to the word of God because they're behind me going, <laughs> and I'm like, what are you, oh, what were you talking about again? <laughs> You see, there's a principle there, isn't there? The Holy Spirit, listen, the Holy Spirit will never interrupt himself. Why would he do that? He is trying to get us to understand Jesus Christ, and people laughing behind me, which is not in Scripture, and they're interrupting the pastor. I got a couple problems with that. And here's another question for you, those given to extremes. Is what you are seeing manifested in your service profiting all? Or is it just profiting you? Because you like to see something new. Because you like the extraordinary. Because you are bored with Christianity and you want to see something happen. Something spectacular. Questions. 
But let's look at the gifts that Paul talks about. First of all, words of wisdom. Words of wisdom are a solution to a problem that you don't know, didn't have a clue how to do it. Like if you fix a car and you don't use YouTube or anything like that and you have no clue what an engine is, right? And all of a sudden you're fixing the thing. My favorite example is Solomon in the Bible. He had two women fighting over a baby. One was the real mom and one was the fake mom. And they were both saying, that's my baby, that's my baby. And so Solomon, a man who had asked God for wisdom, got wisdom. And he said, here's what we'll do. We will tear the baby in half and give each of you half. And the real mom said, let her have the baby because she loved the baby. The other woman was like, that's fine. The wisdom, it was a novel solution to a serious problem. You remember in the book of Acts chapter 6, there was the women, the widows, and some were getting chintzed on their food. And the leaders saw this issue would pull them, ap pull them apart. So a word of wisdom came, and they delegated the job to seven worthy men. And the fruit of the wisdom we see in that chapter, it says that all were pleased. There's been many times where I've been in meetings where there's a contentious issue, and then all of a sudden somebody drops an idea down, and everybody's like, that's it. It's a word of wisdom. Now let's move on to words of knowledge. By the way, do we want these things active in our church? Words of wisdom? Absolutely. Lord, give me words of wisdom. And notice, a word of wisdom is going to come when it's needed, right? That could happen any time. We just need to have the Holy Spirit in us and be willing vessels to say, hey, if you want to use me in that way, Lord, use me. Words of knowledge. That's revelation of facts that are unknowable to you. One of my favorite examples is one from Pastor Chuck Smith. And he talks about these mailers that kept coming to him, kept coming to him. But anyways, he's in the middle of a message, and he just happens to say Lido, which is a city or an area, and then he says White Cadillacs. He says these guys who live in Lido and drive these white Cadillacs, and he was talking about false teachers. Well, a guy calls him up and says, how dare you talk about me? And Chuck Smith, in all honesty, said, I have no idea who you are. I've never heard of you. I, I don't know where you live, and I don't know. And, but the Holy Spirit had given him a word of knowledge, and that man was busted. Now he has to deal with, because the message was, you are living in posh and, 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 and you know, all this wealth. And the, the Holy Spirit was using Chuck Smith and gave him a word of knowledge to correct this man. Do we think we need words of knowledge? Uh, a friend of mine, Fred, we're sitting in a service, and he finally gets his neighbor to come to church. He is excited. Man, he's been working on this guy for a long time. So they sit right up in the front row, and, and the pastor starts teaching. And he's, he's just all of a sudden just, if you're living with your girlfriend, you need to move out now. We'll find you a place to stay. At the end of the service, this guy goes, why did you tell the pastor about me? Why? What do you, what? How dare you tell the pastor about me? And he was incensed. And my friend Fred is like, I didn't say a word. Who was it? It was the Holy Spirit speaking through Pastor Danny into this man's heart. A word of knowledge. Why did God do that? To out this man? No, to get this man to realize that there is an almighty God who wants him walking right, walking in righteousness. It's a scary one, isn't it? Because sometimes we don't want things. We'd like to remain in ignorance on those things. Then he says another gift that you could have is faith. Every man, it says in the Bible, that every man is given a measure of faith, but there's a supernatural gift of faith. It has you doing things that under normal, natural circumstances, there's no way you could do it. Abram, leaving the land of Ur, that's a supernatural gift of faith. 
our family going to Russia, supernatural faith, because the natural Lee would no way do that. Wouldn't, there was things that I was doing that were not natural for me. Leading my family, for instance, going into the airports, going to the bus terminals, and taking charge of things. That was not who I was at that time. I'd be like, honey, could you go do that? Hey, Heather, you're good at that stuff. Go do that. Or we might even make Trevor do it, you know? Supernatural gift of faith. You remember when Peter and John in John chapter 4, they look at a crippled man? And the first gift that was demonstrated, there was faith, wasn't it? Peter boldly looks at him and says, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And again, Peter might be, Who's, who just said that? But Peter says, get up. Okay. What's so supernatural about that? Nothing. Get up and walk. It's a crippled man, a man that's been crippled since birth. And he's like, get up and walk. Well, what if the man doesn't get up and walk? Right? That's supernatural faith. Peter knew that by saying that in the name of Jesus, get up and walk, that this man would walk. And the second, of course, that we, the second gift we see is healing right there, right? Healing. Do healings occur today? Are there charlatans out there that pretend healings? Absolutely, right? That happens. But do true, genuine healings occur today? I have seen one. I've only seen it once in my life, but I was in Russia, and this guy, Dan, decides to go. We were going to have a fire, but there was no wood in the forest floor. There was none. So he saw some dead limbs up in these trees, and he decides, I'm going to go climb them. Well, he got up there, and it was amazing. I was like, that is incredible. How does he do that? Well, he fell. He fell, and he, his thumb was injured severely when he fell because he landed on his thumb. And the tendons in here were wrapped up like that bubble gum tape. You remember that when you were playing baseball, the bubble gum tape? It was wrapped up like a coil in his hand. I saw it. We prayed for him, and it went away. You see, I can't explain that, but I saw it with my own two eyes. Healings happen. Supernatural faith, words of knowledge, words of wisdom. Do you see how blessed the body can be by these? Now, we're not to chase these things. I don't want us going away and go, man, I want some of these exciting things happening. Because what is the purpose of a healing? to glorify God so that unbelievers see and they come to faith. In the Bible, when Jesus was per performing a miracle, uh, good translations will actually call them attesting miracles. They attest to who Jesus was. They were to draw people to Jesus. We're not to be drawn to the miracles and the healings themselves. We're to be drawn to the Savior who is the one who does these things. The person being used is nothing because all glory is to go to God. Now, the next one is the working of, a, of miracles. And this is different than healing. This is a miraculous thing. There's miraculous things happening all the time, isn't there? I mean, the fact that I'm saved, that to me is a miracle. You being saved as well. <laughs> Some of the guys right in here, I'm like, that's a miracle that you're saved, right? Miracles happen all the time. But the Holy Spirit can empower a person with this gift, and they work a miracle. Oftentimes, the working of a miracle, we're talking about some way, somehow, that there is an overcoming of the natural laws. For instance, when Moses put down his staff and the Red Sea parted, that's a miracle. Okay? And th these things can happen today. Prophecy. Now, a prophecy is speaking about a warning about the future. That's one aspect of the prophecy. But it could be just teaching of the word. When I'm reading this word, this word has a prophetic aspect to it. There is foretelling. It's, this is what's going to happen. And then there's foretelling, the foretelling of the word. And so the Holy Spirit can take this word that I'm sharing with you, and you go... Wait a second, I don't have the Holy Spirit. 
None of these things ever have ever occurred in my life. I've never had a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. Maybe I need the Holy Spirit. It could be convicting you that you, you are saved and that you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit because you are somewhat fruitless in your life. Right? But it's not me saying it. It's the Holy Spirit. In fact, what I just said was not in my notes, and maybe that was from the Holy Spirit for you. And then there's discernment of spirits. We need this in the last times. The last days, Jesus promised that there would be many, many false teachers, but we don't need to worry about that. We can, we can ferret those false teachers out quickly because we have the Spirit of God. We can discern, but there are times where we need to have that discernment of spirits. Somebody walks into the church and they have an evil spirit. But God's given you the Holy Spirit and you can discern that spirit and perhaps save the congregation from whatever this person intended to do. The discerning of spirits. You can tell that there's a spirit in a person and it's not good. You know, not all spirits are good, right? There's evil spirits out there. There are lying spirits. So it's so good that we have the Holy Spirit to help us with discernment. And then, speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues gets so much press. And I think it's a wonderful gift. And I think people get afraid of it. But it's ignorance. We just don't know. We've been taught something. For instance, some churches teaches, teach that if you don't speak in tongues, you are not saved. Um... You can believe that, but you can't back it up with Scripture. There's nowhere, anywhere where it says that. Paul said that I would rather that you speak three or four or whatever it was, words in an intelligible tongue than thousands of words in tongues. You see, the speaking in tongues can happen two ways, and this is the only gift, by the way, that is actually personal or can be. Okay, speaking in tongues primarily is a prayer language. People do it when they're alone with the Lord, and they speak things that are in their heart in an unknown language to them, and it, it, it bypasses uh, our ability, you know, our speech, and we just speak these words, and they're pure words and holy words. They're praise words. They're edifying to the father but it also can happen in a church service now just so we know when we're in a church service we're not gonna we wouldn't allow that in a sunday service we would exercise those gifts during a special service but in the sunday service because when people came in and, and heard these things they might be drawn away but speaking in tongues is valid but there are rules that paul sets forth and it's powerful for the body. If. If what? The next gift is being exercised as well. Interpretation. There is never to be a public utterance of the speaking in tongues in a public service without the interpretation. Okay, I've been in services. And actually I had to study this because the guy was speaking in tongues and then he interpreted what he just said. And I was like, I don't think you can do that. But actually, if you look, search the scriptures, it actually was valid. And it was really cool, too, because in this church, the pastor stopped and explained everything, explained why it was biblical and why what was happening in case there was anybody in there that might be confused. And you know what it was? It wasn't like, I'm great, check me out. I've got gifts, speaking in the tongues, check. No, what the man said was beautiful praise to the Lord. And when I'm at home speaking in tongues, it's beautiful praise to the Lord. But in a church setting, must be interpretation. And the last point, and we'll close it up here, is that the Holy Spirit, he is in charge of distribution. And aren't you glad for this? Aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit's in charge of the distribution of his gifts? Because I would pick wrong. I would desire this or that. 
Just like when the wife sends me shopping, right? Honey, go get food for the week. Okay. And then I get home and, honey, all you got were chips, nuts, cheese, and seltzer water. What? What? Was I supposed to get something else? No, the Holy Spirit's in charge of the distribution of the gifts, and that's a good thing. See, he hears from Jesus what the church needs. And he gives gifts to help the body to be the church. Jesus envisions this church a certain way. And the Holy Spirit helps execute that by giving us various gifts at various times. We don't need all of these gifts happening at all the time, but there are times. And listen, he is in charge of the gifts and the distribution, but we can ask. Paul says, eagerly desire. That means I can ask. Ask for the gifts, but whatever the Holy Spirit wants for me, that's what I want. I don't want to try to pick the gifts and pretend that I'm walking because that's what it's going to be. I'll be pretending, but if God gives me the gift, it will be supernatural. And know that gifts can be for a short time. We don't need them sometimes for, you know, because people do. They'll say, what's your gift? Well, I have the gift of discernment. Yeah, but I just saw you do something really stupid. So you don't have it all the time, do you? Like, you don't have it all the time. God gives it to us, certain gifts, at a certain time, for that time, to solve a problem, perhaps, or to convict a person. Maybe you're living with your girlfriend and now you're convicted. That wasn't in my notes, by the way. He wills. That's another important thing. It says he wills. What does that mean? It means he's been, the Holy Spirit has been using personal pronouns about himself, but he says he wills. It means he has a will. An entity or a force can't have a will. The Holy Spirit is a person. I don't want you getting carried away by some false teacher who says it's just a force or some entity. The Holy Spirit has a will, and he will carry out his will, and he will distribute the gifts how he sees fit. The Holy Spirit is not a force. He is the third person of the Trinity. And again, remember that we saw proof of the Trinity right here in this passage. Let's close with 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith. I don't want any of you going anywhere. And don't get comfortable in your pajamas at home, by the way, because this is a church when people are in it, right? And just staying at home all the time, sometimes we have to be there, and I get that. But let's not get comfortable gathering by ourselves. It's not church. Church is when we gather together, and it's going to be great when we do. But some will depart from the faith. Have you, have you known somebody who's walking with the Lord? Seemed like they were going great gangbusters, and they just fall away. Well, one thing that could have happened is... As Paul points out here, maybe they gave heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Demons have doctrines? Yes. Some doctrine is demonic, isn't it? And spirits learn from their father, the father of lies, Satan. There's deceiving spirits out there, and there's doctrines of demons. And they speak lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared as with a hot iron. I don't want any of us to be carried away in ignorance. As Paul exhorted the Corinthians, I exhort you and I. We need to remember these vital things about the Holy Spirit. We need to not fear the Holy Spirit, and we need not to go to excesses, and we need to not deny the Holy Spirit. We need to remember these things that we've learned here in these 11 verses, that he is 
the greatest spiritual gift that you will ever receive. And when he gives you a gift, it is for the body. It's, it ain't about you. And know that he has many gifts to give. And it's the Holy Spirit who is in charge of that distribution. Let's ask him. I, I want this church to be so powerful for God. But the power comes from the Holy Spirit. Not from our might, not from our wits and our smarts. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for this time. And we pray that you would uh, burn our hearts with this message and that we would reach up and ask. And Father, even now, if somebody's sitting at home, Lord, and they're realizing um, that their faith, that they realize for the first time that the Holy Spirit is more than they thought, and they didn't know that they could ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I pray that just with childlike simplicity, to just ask and that you would baptize them with your Holy Spirit, that you would come upon the believers of Calvary Chapel Bellevue, but of your church worldwide, anybody who hears this message. Let them ask and let them know that these gifts are precious and they come from the Holy Spirit, who is our greatest gift. And then we are to use the gifts for the glory of God and not for the glory of man. So, Father, I thank you so much for the pen of Paul. Thank you for his submission to you. Thank you for the change that was wrought in his life by the Holy Spirit. And I thank you for the same for me. Father, change us by your word and by your spirit. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. The Lord.